Medicine, law, war, and business were all very different 100 years ago, but not always for the better and frequently for the downright creepy, like arranged marriages for child brides. And that's just the start. Here are some creepy things that were considered normal 100 years ago. For most of history, a newborn baby was generally viewed as one part future laborer and one part old age insurance policy. Children were expected to work from a very young age, helping around the farm, house, or business. By the turn of the 20th century, as the economy evolved and urbanization continued, children were employed in a great variety of industries and trades. The U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics keeps track of these things. They say that, in addition to the traditional farming and agricultural field labor that they'd always done, 100 years ago, rural youth could also be employed in resource extraction. That means things like mining and breaking up and hauling coal. In coastal towns, you could find children fishing, shoring, shucking oysters, or canning. In cities and towns of all sizes, children were employed by mills and factories, making everything from glass products to textiles to kitchenware to cigars. The big cities had legions of children buzzing around as couriers, drivers, cleaners, newsies, and much more. Child labor was integral to just about every level of the U.S. economy, but the children themselves usually didn't even get to enjoy their wages. Generally speaking, society saw kids as an extra money-earning appendage of their parents. On January 17, 1920, after a decades-long effort to convince Americans that society would be improved by banning liquor, the sale of alcoholic beverages in the United States was made illegal. The teetotalers were wrong, though. America turned into a bizarre mirror of itself where the government tried to poison you, while cops and politicians took their orders from the Mafia and the KKK. Resistance to prohibition appeared immediately. Maryland flatly refused to enforce it and many states and municipalities underfunded enforcement. Banning the production and sale of alcohol didn't diminish the desire, so naturally, a market emerged to supply it. And since alcohol was now a most profitable substance, bootleggers and mafia bosses who sold it had lots of money to bribe police officers, politicians, and judges. Did six months for pushing heroin a couple of years back. But you only did six months? Yeah, he bought a judge. Police were openly corrupt, and since prohibition was largely driven by racist, anti-immigrant, and anti-Catholic attitudes, it helped fuel the Ku Klux Klan's resurgent terror campaign. Thirsty Americans risked prison to buy beer, and sometimes their lives. Homemade booze, sometimes referred to as bathtub gin, killed four times as many people during prohibition than alcohol did prior to banishment. By 1926, these deaths were less accidental and more deliberate. Since much of the homemade liquor was distilled using industrial alcohols, the feds increased the amount of methanol, a deadly poison required to make those industrial alcohols. Famed humorist Will Rogers quipped that, quote, "...governments used to murder by the bullet only. Now it's by the court." Yersinia pestis is a pretty famous bacterium. It has the greatest stage name ever, the Black Death, and it rocked the 14th century so hard that one-third of Europe died from its effects. Bubonic plague, however, wasn't just a problem for Europeans dead hundreds of years ago. There were over 1,000 cases in the U.S. during the 20th century. Bubonic plague is primarily transmitted by flea bites, specifically from fleas carried by rats. Rats that came to the U.S. aboard steamships bound for San Francisco in 1900. That city's Chinatown hosted the very first U.S. outbreak of the plague, and it scared California's leaders so much that they conspired to hide it from the rest of the country. San Francisco's mayor and the state governor, along with their willing accomplices and California's media and business titans, actually secured the collaboration of the Surgeon General of the United States in covering up the plague outbreak. At least 172 people died before the outbreak ended. The first 25 years of the 20th century saw over 500 cases of plague, and they would usually be in port towns. In 1920, Galveston, Texas was home to another outbreak. This time, the city acted quickly. The source of the disease was discovered, which as always was rats, and Galveston embarked on a two-year rodent murder spree that helped end the outbreak with only 11 dead. Healthcare wasn't a pleasant experience in the early 20th century. For women, it was worse. It will probably be of little surprise that women faced challenges entering medicine, but they were also excluded from medical research for a very long time. 
So long, in fact, that including females in medical research trials was only made mandatory in 2016. This exclusion probably contributed to the baffling diagnoses and treatments that women could expect. One popular 1907 book on pregnancy instructed doctors to prep pregnant women by bathing their lady part with bichloride, which is a highly toxic substance now used primarily as a fungicide. Male ignorance of women's medicine wasn't all bad. A popular treatment to the dreaded female hysteria, whose symptoms could basically be any behavior that men didn't like, purportedly involved doctors giving patients a pelvic massage until they were satisfied. As shown in the 2012 film Hysteria, a visionary hero eventually arose and invented an electromechanical treatment, which helped to lead to today's adult toys. Eugenics is the pseudoscientific theory that humans can consciously improve the species through racism. For decades, governments around the world tried to improve their citizens. Not their lives, mind you, but the citizens themselves. Eugenics is a breeding program for humanity, essentially an effort to breed ourselves into a better species. The president of the American Natural History Museum declared in his opening address to a 1923 eugenics conference that responsible governments should make sure the individual races stay in their place and not pollute each other through interbreeding. Those who proved unfit should be sterilized. In fact, the famous Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes had some very disturbing words to say when he voted to uphold several sterilization laws. It is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. In all, 32 states passed some kind of eugenics law at some point. Eugenics was popular and considered progressive. Leaders of organizations like Planned Parenthood and the ACLU joined luminaries like Teddy Roosevelt and Alexander Graham Bell in supporting eugenics programs. California, with its high levels of anti-Mexican and anti-Asian attitudes, was particularly aggressive and successful. Over 20,000 Californians were sterilized in the 20th century. Healthcare might have looked scary for women 100 years ago, but mental health care was terrifying for everyone. It probably shouldn't surprise you that an era obsessed with science and new technology might produce psychiatric treatments that looked more like the work of sci-fi author Philip K. Dick than the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Treatment for mental illness was fashionable for eugenic supporters. States commonly prohibited marriage for individuals with mental illness or went one step further and sterilized them. Over 65,000 mentally ill U.S. citizens were sterilized until the last such operation in Oregon, which actually occurred in 1981. Schizophrenia could be treated with insulin shock therapy, where patients were given progressively larger doses of insulin, leaving them at high risk for brain damage. One New Jersey doctor thought mental illness was caused by untreated infections, and went on a 20-year spree of unnecessarily removing teeth, tonsils, and even organs from patients searching for the cause of mental illnesses. He killed 30 to 45 percent of his victims. But it wouldn't be the early 20th century without electricity and sexism. There was electroshock therapy, which induces seizures by electrocuting the patient, and that particular therapy is still practiced today, though not to the horrific levels of 100 years ago. And even as women fought for the right to vote, there were still doctors who went so far as to claim a direct connection between women's reproductive organs and insanity. This resulted in many women sent to asylums for obvious signs of insanity, which, like so-called hysteria in the 19th century, could be pretty much anything men didn't like. As we sit around and complain about our lack of space vacations, miracle cures for obesity, and our crushing existential boredom, we usually fail to realize just how far we've actually come in just the past 50 years. Before the summer of love, people had some pretty unusual ideas about the world and what the future might hold. Here are some common ideas from 50 years ago that, thankfully, went the way of the banana splits. Oh baby. Pregnancy can cause all kinds of weird body problems, and that includes constipation. And if I don't ever poop again, well that's just gonna be who I am. 
Today, you have to eat healthy or possibly take a fiber supplement to relieve discomfort. But 50 years ago, doctors didn't bother with any of that healthy lifestyle mumbo jumbo. Instead, they advised pregnant women to smoke cigarettes. Alan F. Guttmacher, a legit gynecologist and obstetrician, said as much in his book, Pregnancy and Birth. On top of that, he also said, there is no logical reason to prohibit the moderate use of alcohol during pregnancy to the patient who enjoys and tolerates it. The biggest thing Guttmacher wanted moms to avoid was unsightly weight gain, which he wanted to be limited to 20 pounds. And if an expectant mom was starting to get heavy, try skipping lunch and substitute skimmed milk with a few unsalted crackers. Nothing is more important than keeping your hot pregnant butt, right? Just another reason to keep up your smoking habits before your baby bump gets out of control. So if you are born in the late 60s and came out a little weird, you probably have this guy to blame. Better dead than red. After pumping your baby full of more cigarettes and booze than Tom Waits. Sell your heart to the Tom and baby for a buck. What else can you do to your kid to make them a good, healthy American? According to Dr. Walter W. Sackett Jr., the very first thing you should worry about after giving birth was the spread of communism. In his 1962 book, Bringing Up Babies, Sackett felt that breast milk or formula weren't enough for a newborn, so babies should start eating cereal within two days of escaping the womb. By nine weeks, a baby should be able to chow down on whatever else the family would normally eat, which was apparently mostly booze, cigarettes, and anything that would fit into one of those newfangled microwaves. Sackett wasn't completely crazy. He did recommend waiting until a baby was six months old before starting with black coffee. <laughs> and when your baby cries at night because its blood is basically 90% coffee now, don't even think about coddling it. Sackett insisted that a baby had to learn to suffer and soothing a crying baby was very literally sowing the seeds of socialism. With one lullaby, you can throw off the global balance of power. And everyone knows that in communist Russia, baby has you. Game over. Even though video games are a multi-billion dollar industry today, and heroic fat plumbers have become global phenomenon, the seeds of the industry didn't even exist until 1967. That was when Ralph Bayer assembled a prototype for the first home game system. Bayer worked for a TV company, and though he tried to sell them on the idea of including a game system with their televisions, all but one of his bosses was dismissive. Video games seemed pretty stupid to most of the executives, though he got a little money to produce a prototype. After all, who'd want to play a game on a TV when you had all the thrills of Monkey's Uncle? You're a Monkey's Uncle. It's wild! Complete with stunt mats, cards, horns, clickers, tricks, spinner and monkey timer. Patents were filed by 1971 and the device was sold to Magnavox, who sold it as the Odyssey. Unfortunately, by the time the system debuted, Atari's Pong stole all their glory, making headway through the taboo against TV gaming, which would totally never ever become popular. Pick your brain. Psychiatrist Walter Freeman thought he came across a life-changing medical procedure when he did his first ice pick lobotomy in 1946. See, Freeman figured that depression and mood problems were caused by having too much emotion. So he wanted to cut the emotional connection in the brain, literally. So if you're feeling a little crazy, he took a metal rod and gently jammed it through your eye socket into your brain while you were still awake. If that sounds like a Mortal Kombat fatality, well, it's not too far off. For obvious reasons, people did tend to be much calmer or changed after the procedure, as anyone would be when they're left paralyzed or mentally disabled from a traumatic brain injury. Because there were so few reliable sources and medications available for the mentally ill at the time, it seemed like a great idea. Freeman traveled the country in a van he called the Lobotomobile, and even though an alarming proportion of his patients died along the way, that didn't stop people from coming. This went on until 1967, when he performed a lobotomy on a housewife who later died of a brain hemorrhage. That's when it was finally decided that he'd killed just a few too many people. He was forced to stop poking people's brains, and while lobotomies are still practiced today, they're done a little more carefully. Just make sure your doctor isn't named Scorpion or something. 
friggin laser beams. Laser technology was only just developing 50 years ago, and a lot of what was predicted in the 1967 documentary, The Laser, a light fantastic actually came true. We're now regularly using lasers for surgery and tattoo removal just as predicted. Laser surgery is still highly experimental. By the 21st century, a searing beam of laser light may join the scalpel as an essential surgical tool. But they got one thing very, very wrong. In the late 60s, investors assumed that they'd need something to tackle the major epidemic of typewriter typos. The answer? Lasers. Like the world's most boring sci-fi ray gun, the functional laser eraser would kind of blast a single letter right off the face of a piece of paper without damaging the paper itself. Understandably, this was a pretty big deal when people actually typed stuff with ink instead of pixels. Lasers work their magic, and before you know it, it's like your dumb floppy fingers never even typed that extra E in the first place. By golly, it works. <laughs> it does, all we need to do is miniaturize it and. <laughs> Get it into mass production. Your lowly secretarial job is saved, and it only took 10 minutes and harnessing the most advanced technology that the 60s had to offer. Thanks, lasers. Technology and American cultural norms have changed at such a blindingly fast pace that we sometimes forget just how weird the world used to be. Things that were once commonplace seem strange today, although it's probably also true that humans who live 100 years in the future will think the things we do are pretty strange too. Sadly, we don't have any way to actually show a 22nd century person a YouTube video of someone eating a Tide Pod, but we can at least enjoy our own bemusement at the strange and bizarre habits of our recent ancestors. Homes for disobedient wives and other crazy people. America mostly stopped putting people into insane asylums around the same time poor families quit sticking little kids into orphanages. So hooray for progress! According to the American Psychological Association, though, in the early 20th century, mentally ill people or, you know, women who thought maybe their husbands didn't know everything, were sent to the insane asylum. There, they got to live out the remainder of their days in deplorable conditions because it was way easier than divorce. Not everyone who went to an insane asylum was a woman whose husband couldn't be bothered to divorce her. Some genuinely mentally ill people were placed there, too. But the places were really more like holes to die in than places where the mentally ill could be helped with their condition. Happily, that started to change with the advent of psychotherapy and with the general realization that it's just not nice to put people in insane asylums. When ugly was illegal. No, it's not the plot of a post-apocalyptic young adult novel. 100 years ago, in many big cities across the United States, it was actually illegal to be ugly. <laughs> oh, wait, you serious? According to the Chicago Tribune, in 1881, Alderman James Peavy decided he'd had enough of people he deemed unsightly. So he introduced an ordinance to ban people who were diseased, maimed, mutilated, or in any way deformed so as to be an unsightly or disgusting object from the streets of Chicago. After World War I, when veterans returned home with missing limbs and other disfiguring battle scars, public opinion towards the disabled started to change. But ugly laws remained on the books and their enforcement continued up until the 1950s. Chicago's ugly law wasn't officially dropped until 1974. Trick or turkey! Before there was Halloween, there was Thanksgiving. No, really. People used to dress up in costumes, run around the streets asking for candy, go to extravagant parties on Thanksgiving. According to NPR, an 1897 LA Times article claimed that Thanksgiving was the busiest time of year for manufacturers of and dealers in masks and false faces. But the rambunctious, candy-hungry kids bothered a lot of people. New York's school superintendent even complained that the tradition seemed designed to mostly just annoy adults and was incompatible with modernity. Kids really didn't want to give up the whole candy-getting thing, though, and by the 1930s, the practice of going door-to-door -door in search of treats became a Halloween tradition. Although it was mostly an organized event meant to curtail vandalism and violence, hence the expression, trick-or-treat. When Cigarettes Cured Asthma you think your doctor is giving you iffy medical advice? Well, chew on this. 100 years ago, it was not only common for doctors to dismiss the risks of smoking, but sometimes they would also appear in tobacco advertising saying things like cigarettes provide temporary relief of paroxysms of asthma. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. 
The reason cigarette companies did this is pretty insidious. By the early 20th century, most people were kind of catching on to the whole cigarettes might be bad for you thing, which is what consumers will naturally do when they notice that a product seems to be associated with people dying. What's even sadder, of course, is that those doctor-endorsed cigarette ads persisted well into the 60s, when the Surgeon General finally said, hey, guess what, smoking actually is bad for you. Well, duh. 100,000 doctors have quit smoking cigarettes. You can, too. Professional Waker Uppers Before alarm clocks were invented, people still had to get up in the morning. Some people practiced the art of overdrinking, or drinking so much water before bed that you'd wake up early because you had to pee. Ingenious, really. There were also other, more precise methods of making sure you got up in the morning. According to the BBC, in the UK and Ireland, there was actually a profession called a knocker-upper. Yeah, yeah, we know what you're thinking. You're gross. A knocker-upper was actually a person who went around the neighborhood with a long stick tapping on people's windows, and then presumably had to duck to avoid all the bricks being thrown by people who just wanted 10 more minutes. Oddly, the practice didn't completely die out until the 1970s, probably because a tap on the window was really a much nicer way to wake up than that awful shriek from your alarm clock. Early 20th Century PowerPoint Somewhere between cavemen staring at their reflections in a puddle and millennials gazing unblinking into their smartphones was the Magic Lantern Show, an early form of screen entertainment that preceded the movie theater by a couple hundred years. The technology was simple. An artist would paint an image on a piece of glass, and then the image would be projected onto a screen, much like a PowerPoint presentation. Except it was meant to not actually put entire audiences to sleep. Unsurprisingly, as movies got more popular, magic lantern shows got less popular, until one day people finally said to themselves, why am I falling asleep in these lame magic lantern theaters when I can fall asleep in a movie theater instead? And then magic lantern shows went the way of the Palm Pilot, leaving us all to hope that PowerPoint presentations will one day follow. Did you know that radioactive soap was very popular a century ago and people cleaned with Lysol where? Keep watching to find out what other strange hygiene habits Americans had a hundred years ago. It wasn't until 1888 that the first commercial deodorant hit the shelves, but it was less than ideal. It took another two decades or so for another less acidic deodorant to be invented. But it wasn't until the 1920s that good old-fashioned marketing did some serious magic. This new concoction was originally invented by a surgeon. It was meant to keep hands sweat-free. His daughter had a clever idea, though, and created a new type of deodorant. She named it Odorono and tried selling it to people for their pits. It was initially a complete failure, until that is she hired a marketing team. Sales did all right, but it wasn't until 1919 that marketing realized what the problem was. People knew that there was a product out there that could stop body odor, but they just didn't know they needed it. So they kicked off a campaign against BO, taking out a series of advertisements with the same message packaged differently. They implored women not to stink or they'd drive away the men. It was the brainchild of a copywriter named James Young. He would write in his memoir that his suggestion that body odor was offensive did some serious damage to his own relationships with women. And while there was some serious outrage, Odor Ono's sales rose 112% in that year. By 1929, it was a million-dollar company. By the end of the 1920s, they had successfully convinced American women that deodorant needed to be a part of the daily hygiene regimen. Even though the University of the Pacific School of Dentistry says that toothpicks have been used as far back as 5,000 years ago, it was only in the 1920s that humankind got a decently pleasant toothbrush. At the end of the 19th century, American toothbrushes were mostly made from bone handles and boar bristles. Though more modern toothbrushes existed by the turn of the century, by 1920, the few Americans who even had a toothbrush, about 20% of the population, had one that was imported from Japan. What about the dental hygiene of the other 80%? they were probably better off not brushing their teeth, as the brushes of the era were so stiff they could do more damage to gums than good to teeth. That's not really surprising given that boar bristles are extremely rigid and come to a sharp point. Can you blame people for not wanting to brush with tiny spears? That's not to say that people didn't care for their teeth. The 1920s saw the development of things like x-rays for teeth and the establishment of formal guidelines for dental schools. Many employers had dentists on contract and available to see the dental concerns of employees. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century that bathing became a fairly regular thing. A lot of America's hesitation was simply a lack of access to clean water. Bathhouses started being built in the 1890s, but it took a while for bathing to catch on. You can bathe in the next room. I'm fine. 
You, my friend, are very far from fine. You reek of old horse. As the U.S. rang in the Roaring Twenties, it's safe to say that bathing was commonplace, but soap was less so. Bathhouses had initially attracted customers by handing out soap. Cosmetic companies saw this trend and hopped on the bandwagon. With cosmetics companies stealing customers, people in the soap business found that they needed to convince consumers that they should use their product to get clean. So-called cosmetic cleansers were such a threat that Big Soap organized a trade association called the Association of American Soap and Glycerin Producers. They then created the Cleanliness Institute to teach the public why soap was better than, say, bathing with cold cream. Research from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock found the Institute's advertising, news releases, and hygiene materials ended up being a wildly important service to public health. Even schools started teaching children the importance of using soap, and by 1930, it was the norm. Today, people who are trying to cut down on how much plastic and packaging they use are discovering shampoo bars. But here's the surprising thing. A hundred years ago, it was the norm for washing hair. Liquid shampoo wasn't invented until the 1920s, and instead, people used bars that were essentially cleaning ingredients compressed into a bar. It was used just like soap. Lather between the palms, massage into the hair and scalp, rinse. In some ways, it's actually easier to use than modern shampoo. It's much quicker to rinse the lather from a shampoo bar out of hair. The independent pharmacist says that a common alternative was using regular soap for shampoo, but that tended to leave a weird film. It wasn't until 1927 that a German chemist invented liquid shampoo. At the time, it was pretty standard to wash your hair once every few weeks. It took a while for the idea of liquid shampoo to make it to the States. In fact, Procter & Gamble didn't make their version until 1934. Menstruation has always been a bit of a taboo subject, and that was definitely true in the 1920s. It was in this same era that women suddenly had access to something that would revolutionize feminine hygiene forever, disposable sanitary pads. It's pretty fascinating how the whole thing came about. It started with the development of something called cellucot. This material was originally used for bandages during World War I. Frontline nurses quickly realized they could be used for more than just absorbing the blood from war wounds. Kotex sold their first sanitary napkins in Chicago in 1919, but there was a huge problem. Female customers didn't want to tell male shop clerks what they needed. What followed was a massive advertising campaign emphasizing Kotex's reputation of being discreet. They began encouraging women to ask for them by name. After that, women had, for the first time, what was defined as a medically sanctioned hygienic product to use. They were no longer forced to use whatever home solution they came up with. As the decade moved on, more and more women turned to disposable sanitary napkins for the first time. Not only were they more hygienic, but they were much more reliable as well. Good hygiene down below is just as important as it is up top, but that wasn't the case until incredibly recently. It was only about 100 years ago that America started using purpose-built toilet paper. Americans spent years wiping their nether regions with the Sears robot catalog, even after the invention of what modern eyes would see as a perfectly acceptable toilet paper. Aloe-infused toilet wipes were invented way back in 1857, but they were considered medicinal. It took a long time to get the public on board with buying a product just for backslide cleanup. It was a genius marketing campaign from a popular paper company at the time that got people there. In 1928, the paper manufacturer introduced a new kind of paper that wasn't medicated. It was soft and would make cleanup a gentle sort of experience. It was called Charmin. Everyone squeezes new Charmin here. Just smell nice. So a century ago, Americans were just beginning to get used to using toilet paper regularly. If that's not weird enough, here's one final footnote. It wasn't until 1930 that a toilet paper hit the market that could be advertised as splinter-free. Now that's a marketing campaign. Just the smell of Lysol is enough to let someone know it's strong stuff and is probably not something that's going to be kind to your body's soft tissues. Still, a hundred years ago, women were using it as part of their feminine hygiene rituals. And here's the terrifying thing. Doctors knew this wasn't a good idea as early as 1911. That's when they saw 193 women suffer from Lysol poisoning and another five die from the effects of using Lysol. Keep in mind that this is a product that is used for killing ringworm, the flu virus, cholera, and for disinfecting bathrooms. Advertisers throughout the 1920s and even into the 1930s dubbed Lysol as the perfect product to use in the upkeep of dainty feminine allure. Countless ads warned women that if they didn't spray some Lysol into their most private areas to stay fresh and clean, they were going to chase their men away. Ads often blame women's failed marriages on bad hygiene, or lack thereof, and promoted it as being dual purpose. Not only did they claim that Lysol cleaned a woman thoroughly, but it was also an effective means of birth control. It absolutely wasn't. 
By the 1890s, the big bushy beards of the Civil War had given way to a more finely groomed, carefully managed style of facial hair. At the time, the only option men had for facial hair hygiene was a straight razor. It was that way for a long time, until about 100 years ago. In 1904, a man with the unlikely name of King Gillette invented the safety razor, letting American men rely less on the barber and more on their own at-home routines. That was just the beginning, and by the 1920s, Jacob Schick made things even more efficient. Schick was living in Alaska when he decided he was going to overcome some major problems with safety razors. They were hard to reload, and anyone who didn't have water handy was out of luck, so he invented a dry-shaving motorized razor that was inspired by the same mechanism that reloaded repeating rifles. Schick introduced something even more revolutionary to the landscape of male grooming than the simple safety razor. In 1928, he created the first electric razor. It took him just two years to sell a million of them, and they've been used to keep skin smooth and injury-free ever since. Hygiene and personal grooming go hand in hand, and 100 years ago, the idea of what hair was acceptable for women began to change. It was around the turn of the century that removing hair was seen as hygienic. Body hair was considered masculine, and starting in the 1920s, something important was happening in women's fashion. Dresses were getting shorter, and sleeves were disappearing. Parts of the body that had been covered during the Victorian era were now on display to the world. Companies that were making newly invented safety razors to men realized they could market razors to women. Advertising campaigns made women feel shame about the hair growing on their legs and armpits. At the start of the decade, shaving legs was so uncommon that when one Kansas girl cut her leg, it made the national news. But it wasn't long before advertisers were condemning underarm and leg hair as one of the biggest embarrassments a woman could suffer. That meant it wasn't long before many were using all of the razors, blades, and creams that were flooding the market. By the 1940s, Harper's Bazaar declared, If we were dean of women, we'd levy a demerit on every hairy leg on campus. It wasn't long after Marie and Pierre Curie discovered radium that people became downright infatuated with the glow-in-the-dark properties of it. It was used for painting watch dials, sure, but according to Georgetown University, it was even used to make a radioactive energy drink that was all the rage during the 1920s. Folks, get your bottle of radioactive water. Radical. It has the same effect on the human body as recharging electric batteries. Radium, and by extension radioactivity, found its way into scores of hygiene products, too. Throughout the 1920s and into the 1940s, consumers were told that things like radioactive toothpaste, hair care products, and makeup were going to make them bigger, better, and stronger. Some of these products packed a massive punch, and surviving examples still set off Geiger counters. What kind of products? Radium Hand Cleaner boasted that it takes off everything but the skin. Or radium emanation bath salts could be added to a daily bath solution to combat things like insomnia and relieve the pain of arthritis. There were also products like X-Ray Soap, which was advertised as being able to clean everything from clothes to cars. In 2021, one reporter spent a week following some of the cleaning routines described in the 1920s era Good Housekeeping book on the business of housekeeping. Once she started it, it became clear that a 1920s homemaker had her work cut out for her. Every day was filled with scores of chores to keep the house as spick and span. The routines included things like washing dishes three times a day, dusting, and mopping. But it also involved setting the table and serving meals, bumping pillows and cushions, and making sure there were fresh flowers in all the cases. But that's not all. Women also aired out blankets and sheets, polished mirrors and silverware, and made sure to clean guest bedrooms even if there were no guests in sight. After a week, the verdict was that it was incredibly exhausting. The meal-making, the laundry, the twice-weekly changing of pillowcases, and the cleaning under things that are better just left unmoved were nearly impossible to keep on top of. It was by Wednesday that she declared the novelty of this project had officially worn off. The 60s were a strange time. To think that back in the day, misogyny reigned supreme, workout machines were basically useless, and seatbelts were considered wholly unnecessary. Without further ado, please buckle your seatbelt before we take this cringe-inducing trip down memory lane. History is full of crazy weight loss devices, but the craziest might be the vibrating belt workout machine, which was supposed to jiggle the fat off while you just stood there. According to the Orange County Register, the vibrating belt machine was a must-have device in fitness centers for decades, although most health experts knew they were essentially useless. Still, people have continued to find variations on this device rather irresistible over the years. Introducing the revolutionary Vibro Action Belt. Just turn it on and it will literally vibrate the fat away from your abs. 
Deep down, people really want to believe there's some magical technique that will help us drop those extra pounds without having to focus on diet and regular exercise. You probably wouldn't be too surprised if you were told that many male executives hired secretaries based on their looks in the 1960s. But airlines really took that notion to the extreme. You see, there's a reason most flight attendants can't stand being called stewardesses nowadays. According to Vanity Fair, the word stewardess harkens back to a time when attending to people on a flight basically boiled down to looking awesome in a miniskirt. Feeding and caring for a plane load of passengers can be as glamorous as a stint behind the counter at the 5 and 10. In those days, you could get a job as a stewardess only if you were between the ages of 20 and 27 and happened to weigh no more than 140 pounds. Oh, and you had to be at least 5'2", but no taller than 5'9". Oh, and you needed to be unmarried and childless, too. Basically, you had to be conventionally attractive and potentially available. Stewardesses, like jetliners, must be slinky sex symbols. Pilots can be homely and bald. Job training included lessons on how to walk seductively and how to put on your makeup. Meanwhile, you reportedly had to retire at the age of 32, if not long before then. The stewardess works an average of 18 months, then quits, just a year and a half. Some get married, frequently to passengers. 50 years ago, people thought seatbelts were annoying and oppressive. In fact, most people didn't even want them in their cars. According to Second Chance Garage, customers were so fed up with seatbelts by 1949 that many people would actually cut them out of their cars with razor blades. By the early 1960s, seatbelts were offered as optional equipment on the vast majority of American cars, but that didn't really change anything. Most people simply didn't want them, and even people who had them in their cars tended not to use them. By 1966, only about 30% of the cars on the road in America had seatbelts, and approximately 44% of the people driving those cars used them full-time. In 1968, the powers that be finally passed a law requiring seatbelts as standard equipment in all cars, but that didn't really change anything. This wasn't just because people didn't like the idea of seatbelts. Reportedly, some auto manufacturers were accused of designing the belts to be uncomfortable, as sort of a nose-thumb to government regulations. That persistent hostility was largely the reason it took so long for anyone to actually pass real laws. The first mandatory seatbelt law didn't reach the books until the mid-1980s, and that was only in New York at first. As the New York Times reported on December 1, 1984, New York State's mandatory seatbelt law, the first in the nation, went into effect today. Drivers and front seat passengers must wear seatbelts or face fines up to $50. Pass this seatbelt, please. Throughout the 60s, teenage girls were spoon-fed some terrible advice. In 1967, Seventeen published a whole book of etiquette entitled The Seventeen Book of Fashion and Beauty, which advised young women that good speech is more important than the actual words you say. The sound, the smile, the gentleness, warmth, and vitality. The voice that says, I like people, I like you. Meanwhile, the book also offered this not-so-cheerful tip. If a girl slumps her shoulders, it's a safe bet she hopes nobody will notice anything about her. Probably nobody will. Women in the 1960s were basically expected to be subservient to their husbands. Oh, this coffee is criminal! Honey, you kill the petunias! According to Little Things, women could refer to a number of manuals in order to clarify whose needs came first. Spoiler alert, the needs of the husband came first. Try the coffee. Coffee? Oh, your coffee's always a real treat. For example, Housekeeping Monthly's article, The Good Wife's Guide, instructed women to have a delicious meal ready on time for your husband's return. Also, the article suggested that women should always touch up your makeup, put a ribbon in your hair, and be fresh looking. Meanwhile, the article assured that catering for his comfort will provide you with immense personal satisfaction. In conclusion, yikes. Harold, is the coffee all right? Mm-mm. You mean it's as bad as yesterday? In 2007, we were eagerly awaiting new movies in the Pirates of the Caribbean and Spider-Man franchises. Beyonce and Rihanna topped the charts, and everyone was wrapped up in the drama of the sexy doctors on Grey's Anatomy. So, life today might not seem that different from our lives back then, but 2007 wasn't exactly the same as it is now. A lot of predictions from just 10 years ago ended up being kinda bogus. Observe! The iPhone would fail. With a headline that they'll probably regret for the rest of its days, technology site TechCrunch confidently announced in 2006, we predict the iPhone will bomb. It's a classic Dewey defeats Truman type of headline that will go down as one of the most wrong-headed predictions ever made. Now, TechCrunch wasn't insane. When the iPhone first came out, it seemed ridiculous that a phone would have so many extraneous uses, 
Sure, checking your email on your phone is great, but what else would anyone want to do on the thing? Conan O'Brien even ran a sketch making fun of the phone's many uses, starring a before-she-was-famous Ellie Kemper. Lip gloss, a condiment dispenser, mace. But why was TechCrunch so sure the iPhone would be a disaster? Well, they thought the glass would crack too much. They figured people would just buy iPods instead, and they found the iPhone virtual keyboard laughable, saying, that virtual keyboard will be about as useful for tapping out emails and text messages as a rotary phone. Don't be surprised if a sizable contingent of iPhone buyers express some remorse at ditching their BlackBerry when they spend an extra hour each day pumping out emails on the road. That did not happen. Cyborg Nation. In 2007, Brian Williams ran a story about predictions for America's future 10 years down the line. Since it was coming from Brian Williams, you knew it had to be true and very trustworthy. It's Brian Williams, America's favorite newsman. He certainly wouldn't exaggerate a story for dramatic effect or outright lie to the American public. Anyway, the segment focused mainly on how technology would change in a decade's time. It predicted that everyone in the country would have a cybernetic implant containing all their personal data. The year is 2017. You're rushed to a hospital, unconscious with no ID or medical history, but thanks to a microchip under your skin, it's all there. Other predictions about widespread use of facial recognition technology and invasive marketing techniques were at least a little closer to reality. But so far, Williams is still striking out on those crazy stories in rainbows would destroy music. Radiohead made a bold move with the release of their album In Rainbows. Before selling physical CDs, they'd sell digital downloads and the customer would pay whatever they wanted for the album. For some in the media, this kind of anarchy spelled the end of music as we know it. The Sunday Times declared it the day the music industry died, while The Guardian pronounced it a death knell for up-and-coming artists who would never be able to afford to essentially give their music away for free. Of course, they were wrong. The In Rainbow stunt had almost no impact on the industry, but letting fans play songs for free on YouTube and services like Spotify has become the norm. Ringtones could save music. Music executives freaking out about In Rainbows had one trick up their sleeve. Ringtones. Yes, 10 years ago, ringtones were big business, an embarrassing fact for all of us who bought clocks by Coldplay to let us know when the dermatologist calls to tell us that the new ointment we needed has arrived. Since the music industry was starting to falter from piracy and the move toward digital single sales, ringtone sales gave industry leaders hope of a phone revolution. Madonna even released her song Hung Up as a ringtone before it came out as a single. Luckily for everyone who doesn't want to hear Mambo No. 5 every time they're in a waiting room, iPhones arrived. Remember those from earlier in this video? Suddenly your phone became your music player, and the idea of ringtones saving the music industry went extinct. Thank goodness. Certainly not the worst ringtone I've ever heard. Yeah, that might be the worst. People aren't narcissists. TechCrunch had kind of a rough time in 2007. After declaring the iPhone was doomed, they doubled down on bad predictions by insisting that websites like Facebook and Wikipedia, which rely on user-generated content, were doomed because people are just too lazy to keep posting this crap. Citing the failures of Friendster and MySpace as proof, they reasoned that people would get tired of updating their profiles and return to their real lives instead. Wrong again. TechCrunch obviously didn't realize that for most people, social media is their real life now. And with things like YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram all becoming internet mainstays in the last decade, there's just no telling where this is going to take us over the next 10 years. Hopefully, Brian Williams will be back soon to let us know. In the early 1990s, things were different. People watched Bill Cosby portraying a beloved family man and sweater aficionado on TV. The idea of the Chicago Cubs winning a World Series seemed impossible. Street sharks were going to live forever. Half shark, half man. Let's look at some other things we believed back then that turned out to be wronger than wrong. Carbs were king. In 1992, the FDA unveiled a food pyramid to explain to ever-widening Americans what they should eat. The bottom of the food pyramid suggested eating 6 to 11 servings a day of carbs, and that fats and oils should be consumed sparingly. This super-high-carb, very-low-fat diet was considered the way to good health and losing weight. Fettuccine Alfredo. Time to carbo-load. One of the biggest figures pushing this sort of diet was Susan Powder, with her Stop the Insanity weight loss crusade, which emphasized this diet. Except she was wrong, and according to Time magazine, 
Her emphasis on processed, low-fat foods that were high in sugar only caused people to gain weight. Basically, this pyramid only contained a curse. There's sugar, salt, nachos, hot dogs, corn dogs, all the dog food. Since then, the FDA has made several revisions to their food recommendations, most recently in 2011, emphasizing making the most of your veggies and fruits and reducing your carb and grain intake. This idea was backed up by a 2014 National Institutes of Health study that showed people lost more body fat on a low-carb diet than a low-fat one. The idea of filling up on white bread, rice, and cereal is completely outdated. So don't stop the insanity. Stop the unlimited breadsticks at Olive Garden. Invest in comic books. In 1974, Action Comics 1 was worth $400. By 1984, its value had shot up to $5,000. And by 1991, it was going for $82,500. And that wasn't the only comic book increasing in value. Detective Comics number 27, Batman's debut, sold for $55,000 in 1991. Nowhere to go but up, right? We'll also take you to the brave new world of comic books. They are bigger, they're wilder, and they aren't just for kids anymore. Comic speculation made everyone go a little crazy, buying issues they hoped would one day be worth a mint, just like Batman's first adventures. And for a while in the early 90s, even recently published comics were increasing in value. Comic stores popped up everywhere to meet the demand of buyers, and new publishers emerged. But by 1992, the industry had peaked. The market became flooded with hundreds of comics that just about everybody owned, making them essentially worthless. Quality dipped, artists started drawing heroes with too many teeth and not enough bones, and by 1993, the exploding industry collapsed. Classic comics retained their value, but comics from the 90s never really did. That mint death of Superman you've been keeping in a poly bag for 20 years? May as well just rip it open and read it. Spoiler alert, Superman dies. AIDS will get worse. One of the most shocking announcements in sports happened in 1991, when Magic Johnson revealed that he was HIV positive and was retiring from the Lakers immediately. Then, contracting AIDS was considered to be a death sentence. It was also thought of as a disease that only affected gay men, so Johnson revealing he was ill was shocking. It seemed like AIDS was going to become an even more widespread epidemic in America. However, over 25 years later, not only is Johnson still alive, but he's healthy as a horse. AIDS, meanwhile, would become a treatable disease in the United States, thanks to drug therapy. According to the Centers for Disease Control, about 1.2 million people in the U.S. are living with the disease today, and the number of diagnosed cases declined 19% between 2005 and 2014. Millions of infections have been prevented. And around the world, people with HIV are living full and healthy lives with the dignity and respect they deserve. While people still do die from complications from AIDS, it's no longer the automatic death sentence it once was. Killer bees will kill us all. Please listen very carefully. A swarm of killer bees is coming this way. Most people know now that bees are really important to our ecosystem, and their death, thanks to pesticides, parasites, and disease, is a pretty big deal, since they're fairly essential for plant life, and we use plants for, well, everything. But in the early 1990s, people feared bees especially the dreaded Africanized honeybees. Appropriate to the name, the honeybees were imported from Africa to Brazil in the 1950s and were expected to thrive since they were already used to the climate. The bees were ultimately called killer bees and swarmed around the world until arriving in the U.S. in the 1990s. Get off my sugar! Bad bees! Bad! Ow! 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 They're defending themselves somehow! When they did arrive in the U.S., several people did die from being stung by them which caused concern that the bees would go on a rampage and kill many more people. The reputation of killer bees was that they were extra large and extra lethal, but the reality is that they were both smaller and less venomous. They're also more likely to sting and pursue targets for longer distances than regular bees do, so the threat is real. But today, we know that the dreaded killer bee threat never took over all of America, mostly because it never really existed. Beads. Bees? Beads. Beads. Rise of the Super Predators Crime was a huge issue in the early 90s, and with the predicted decay of major urban areas, Super Predators became a legitimate 90s fear. You know every 80s movie about gangs of roving, depraved teenagers ruling vast cities and committing remorseless brutality? This was once a genuine concern. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often 
the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. Criminologists described a bloodbath of violence that was going to destroy the country. John DeLulio Jr., a political scientist, warned that youth crime and violence was hurting the inner city and that it would inevitably spill out into suburban areas and even into those places that have, like, no cell service. So not only would we have to deal with street gangs, but farm gangs as well. So you may be wondering why we're all not living in a 24-7 cesspool of death and crime. Instead of a meteoric rise, crime dropped rapidly in the 90s, and America generally became safer. The super predator went extinct, and America found brand new imaginary things to fear. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay. I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> Don't destroy humans. 50 years doesn't seem like a very long time, but it's enough time for things to have drastically changed, including perceived beauty. From rising hemlines to androgynous looks, the things men found attractive dramatically changed as the world moved into the second half of the 20th century. Hair dye was not always considered entirely acceptable, but that started to change half a century ago. Part of the stigma came about because it was considered vain and disrespectful, but it also had to do with safety concerns surrounding the chemicals used to color hair. As the decades passed, the introduction of home dye kits made colored hair more common. And by the 1970s, nearly half the women in America were reaching for these products. Hair dye company Clairol marketed blonde hair as attractive and desirable starting in the 1950s, pushing the color with ads oozing sex appeal. Clairol even brought us the phrase, blondes have more fun. It's no surprise that by the time the 1970s rolled around, many were opting to go blonde. Those are skin tight. How do you get into those pants, baby? You can start by buying me a drink. <laughs> Many of the most admired women of the era, like Farrah Fawcett, rocked blonde strands. Other notable blondes of the time include Debbie Harry, Olivia Newton-John, Meryl Streep, Peggy Lipton, and Joni Mitchell. Women looking to catch a man's eye 50 years ago were likely to take the tweezers to their eyebrows. That's because thin eyebrows were very much in back then. Thin eyebrows as a beauty standard didn't start 50 years ago, though. The reigning eyebrow look that decade was actually a vintage style that called to mind the dainty eyebrows of the 1920s and the 1930s. Thin eyebrows first came in vogue in the 20th century, along with the rise of the film industry, as they were more visible on camera. While fashion-forward women of the 1940s and 1950s tended to prefer a bolder eyebrow, the 1960s ushered in an era of experimentation in which some people went so far as to shave off their eyebrows and draw them back on with a brow pencil. By the 1970s, Thin was back in, and stars like Donna Summer, Diana Ross, Pam Greer, and Aretha Franklin rocked the thin brows that decade. Lips have mesmerized men since time immemorial and many men 50 years ago found large ones to be particularly appealing. Their attraction to big lips wasn't just driven by the fashion of the era, it's basic biology as full lips signal both youth and vitality. The yearning for pouty lips was nothing new 50 years ago, but it was a change from the dominant lip look of the 1950s, which placed more importance on having a fuller lower lip. The following decade saw more emphasis on both large upper and lower lips. Advancing technology led to some people seeking out some pretty scary methods to achieve the look. In the 1960s, silicone was briefly used as a lip filler but wasn't particularly safe. By the 1970s, silicone was out, and some doctors instead used bovine collagen to give women larger lips. Sex symbols of the day embodied the big-lipped ideal, with Bianca Perez Mora Macias, who was married to Mick Jagger in the 1970s, being the reigning queen. Athletic women were in at the end of the 1960s, but not for the reason that you might think. Athletics were viewed as a way for women to maintain attractive figures. Women became more active in sports in the 1960s, especially in high schools and colleges, although women's sports were not considered to be on par with men's sports. A woman with an athletic physique was considered attractive, but female athletes had a long way to go to be accepted in society. It wasn't until 1972 that the US Congress passed Title IX, which helped secure funding for women's sports. The first female athlete to appear on the cover of Sports Illustrated, Jackie joyner Kersey, didn't do so until 1987. While female athletes today are considered strong and capable role models, the female athletes of the 1960s were largely viewed as hobbyists whose pastimes were only indulged in order to help them remain slim. 
For a time, it looked like fuller figures would be, if not the dominant ideal of beauty, at least an accepted standard. In the 1950s and early 1960s, voluptuous women like Marilyn Monroe were cultural icons. Still, according to writer Sarah Grogan in Body Image, understanding body dissatisfaction in men, women, and children, quote, there was also a significant move toward slimness. As the decade progressed, the slim trend became more pronounced, becoming particularly acute when the fashion model Twiggy became the role model for a generation of young women. As time went on, Grogan wrote, quote, models became thinner and thinner. As models became thinner, curves became less desirable. It was in the late 1960s when the obsession with eliminating cellulite began. Linda Shevchevsky wrote in The Lost Art of Dress, The Women Who Once Made America Stylish, that at this time, quote, curvaceous women were passed over in favor of underweight teenagers. The desire for flatter chests correlated with an obsession for smaller butts as well. One woman who was written about in Vogue magazine in the late 1960s managed to reduce her 39-inch hips down to 34 inches through exercise, standing correctly, and using a special rolling pin. Such regimens were commonplace in the late 1960s. The desire for more boyish figures was not entirely to please men or to conform to fashion. Battleground, the media, edited by Robin Anderson and Jonathan Allen Gray, noted that the changing shape of women's bodies has in many ways served to reflect larger cultural values. Throughout history, quote, a thin, straight figure was prized at times when women were striving to demonstrate their equality. In Fashion, A History from the 18th to the 20th Century, Akiko Fuki wrote that the young found that displaying their physique was the most effective means of setting themselves apart from the older generation. The miniskirt came into vogue as, quote, bare legs developed through various conceptual stages in the 1960s. There's a very <laughs> famous clip clip of me walking down Fifth Avenue in the shortest skirt that you can how imagine. How did you do that? With... Uh, that's how I dressed. As the hemlines rose, more attention was paid to the length and shape of a woman's legs. In women of the 1960s, more than miniskirts, pills, and pop music, author Sheila Hardy wrote that many women felt they, quote, did not have the legs for a miniskirt. The emphasis 1960s fashion placed on women's legs also influenced shoe styles. Tall, pointed boots came into fashion, offsetting the short skirts of the era. The rise of the miniskirt meant that women felt the pressure to put their best leg forward. By the mid-1960s, a new trend was emerging, leg makeup. Makeup had been used on legs before, perhaps most notably during World War II when a shortage of stockings propelled women to draw on stocking seams with eyeliner to make it look like their legs weren't bare. The leg makeup of the 1960s, however, was primarily used to cover up flaws that were now exposed thanks to the shorter hemlines of the era. Women would carefully apply makeup to their legs to cover up blemishes before putting on hosiery. Bruises, scars, and other imperfections were covered up with cosmetics and then further concealed with stockings. The use of leg makeup shows just how conflicted women in this era were. The women's liberation movement was empowering females, and women were beginning to embrace their bodies, but many of them still felt the pressure to conform to society's beauty standards. Coinciding with the preference for more boyish figures was the rise of unisex clothing and androgynous styles. This echoed a similar trend from the 1920s when, quote, androgyny began to be associated with the search for greater independence for women. As written by Rebecca Arnold in Fashion, Desire, and Anxiety, Image and Morality in the 20th Century, Arnold wrote that the rise of androgyny in the 1960s helped to denote freedoms gained and the rejection of a preceding claustrophobic femininity. Perhaps even more interesting is that this inclination towards androgyny was also adopted by men. For a brief time, unisex was everywhere. Indeed, Everett Matlin even wrote in the Chicago Tribune that, quote, the whole male-female relationship is confused. Traditional gender roles were beginning to evolve at this time, which Matlin believed could lead to a, quote, healthier climate. Farrah Fawcett's blonde hair was always styled in a feathered cut in the 1970s, a look that Red Book wrote, quote, essentially defined beauty in the 1970s. Even 50 years later, when many people think of the era, they think of Fawcett's iconic look. Women looking to imitate Fawcett's lusted after locks weren't the only ones to adopt this hairstyle, though. Many men also wore feathered hairstyles in an example of the androgynous look that was considered particularly attractive in that era. While maintaining the soft curls of a feathered hairstyle could be a lot of work for those who weren't blessed with wavy hair, the look wasn't meant to look artificial. Instead, it was part of the time period's commitment to a no-fuss, all-natural look. 
The natural look of 50 years ago wasn't isolated to hairstyles. A fresh face was also considered to be particularly appealing. Natural didn't mean going about with a bare face, though, and women put a lot of effort into getting the perfect sun-kissed glow. Fake tanning was popular, and while most women skipped foundation, they would use bronzer for that bit of shimmer. Makeup colors tended to be more about enhancing the natural color of one's features rather than making them pop with pearlescent colors dominating the color palette. The push towards a more natural look was primarily due to social issues, so women sporting the style would have been particularly attractive to activists of the day. Per Elle magazine, the urge to pare back can be credited to the cultural rise of hippies and anti-Vietnam war feelings, the women's liberation movement, and an interest in all that was natural. There was also a growing awareness of the dangers of pollution, which meant that, quote, cosmetics were at odds with the earthy beauty ideal being celebrated. The suppression of women's curves led to the popularity of what critics and fans alike called a prepubescent look. Lithe, young-looking Lolita types like Twiggy dominated the fashion world. This look of exaggerated youthfulness implied that maturity was a dirty word and a sign of an early death. It sent the message that aging was something to be avoided for as long as possible. The 1960s have today become a symbol for the social conflict between the old and the new. The Lolita look embodied the spirit of the era, representing youth and vigor. A lot of people envisioned the 1960s as a decade-long booze fest where day drinking, especially at work, was the norm. While this is partially true, it was far more acceptable for men to indulge in multiple alcoholic beverages each day than women. We drink because it's good, because it feels better than unbuttoning your collar, because we deserve it. We drink because it's what men do. More and more women were moving away from conventional gender stereotypes, but women who drank frequently were seen as decidedly unfeminine. A glass of wine with dinner or a cocktail on the weekend was acceptable, but getting drunk was not. Warning women not to drink too much was not just a societal pressure, but one that was backed up by public service announcements of the day as well as the mainstream media. The Saturday Evening Post warned in 1962, quote, People think of the woman drunk as an old hag. Among men, heavy drinking is often taken as a sign of virility, and the phrase, drunk as a lord, is a tribute. No one ever said approvingly, she was drunk as a lady. That sentiment was still commonplace at the end of the decade. Drinking in excess may have been taboo for women looking to attract a man, but smoking was considered attractive. While a link between smoking and lung cancer had been established years before, the practice was still widespread. In 1964, the Surgeon General warned that cigarette smoking was a health hazard of sufficient importance in the United States to warrant appropriate remedial action. Despite such warnings, smoking was largely considered to be glamorous and sophisticated. The tobacco industry targeted women in the 1960s, taking advantage of the growing feminist movement by portraying smoking as the pinnacle of gender equality. Virginia Slims were launched as a women's cigarette in 1968 with the slogan, You've come a long way, baby. Other cigarette ads from the late 1960s show young, attractive women partaking in what is shown as an elegant pastime, conveying the message that women who smoked were refined and sexy. By the late 1960s, more women were working than ever. While they were making great economic strides, working women faced a certain stigma. It was far more acceptable for single women to work than married women, as a woman's primary duty was still expected to be to her family. In 1967, just 44% of married American couples lived in dual-income households, compared to more than half of married couples today. Working wives and mothers were thought to destabilize home life and their families. History professor Stephanie Kuntz told the Harvard Business Review that middle-class women were the most stigmatized. If they did choose to enter the workforce, they were expected to wait until their children had grown. She said, And these women, it is hard for modern people to understand just how insecure, how depressed, how low the self-esteem was of these stay-at-home moms in those days. A thousand years ago, creepy things people did were just considered another day at the castle. Whether it was cleaning your clothes in pee or buying groceries with eels, there was no end to the weirdness. Here are some creepy things that were considered normal a thousand years ago. We like to imagine that human sacrifice was something that mostly happened in the unimaginably distant past before people started to get an inkling that maybe the gods just aren't that into blood and severed heads. But just a thousand years ago, people in cultures all over the world were still practicing human sacrifice. Some South American people like the Toltecs were still doing it, but also, surprise, the Vikings. 
The Vikings' blood sacrifices were a pretty regular thing right up until Christianity started to get a foothold around 1000 AD. Vikings would sacrifice people in exchange for stuff. You would have a blot sacrifice if you needed good weather for your crops, to do well in a raid, or maybe if your History Channel series was suffering from declining ratings. India had its own human sacrifice practice, which was popular from about 550 through the 18th century. Called Sati, it was the expectation that if a widowed woman did not have any surviving children, she should throw herself onto her husband's funeral pyre and burn to death. You know, so as to not be a burden to anyone. In the early years of this horrific practice, sati was something a woman did willingly, but at its peak, it was a requirement. Sati was eventually outlawed, though occasionally there are reports of it happening even today. A thousand years ago, if you needed surgery, you didn't go to a physician, you went to a barber, because, you know, scissors. Evidently, people thought that a person who was skilled at cutting hair would also be skilled at cutting human flesh. Physicians were exclusively reserved for the upper class, and a proper physician was way too educated to touch blood or, God forbid, the broken limbs of a dirty peasant. The barber, on the other hand, would handle the care of regular people. It was his job to set broken bones, lance infected wounds, treat injuries, and, if he was skilled enough, saw people's limbs off, and perhaps give them a nice pompadour while he was at it. The really freaky thing about all of this was that physicians were properly educated and accredited at a university and did practically nothing except advise. Meanwhile, the folks who did hands-on stuff that could kill you if it went wrong basically learned it all on the job. Modern medicine may have its problems, but yikes. Today, we believe very strongly that pee belongs in a toilet. But a thousand years ago, people actually thought pee was good for other stuff, too. This belief dates back at least as far as the Roman times, when people would wash their clothes in pee. So good news, if your cat pees in your clean laundry by ancient Roman standards, that makes it cleaner. Now, Really, pee was considered so vital to proper care of clothing that cities would set up barrels on the street for people to pee into, and then they would collect the pee and take it to the public laundry to be put to good use. This is obviously disgusting, but it's not as crazy as you might think. Urine contains ammonia, and ammonia is still commonly used as a cleaning agent. In fact, even after people invented soap, they still like to use pee for the laundry because the ammonia was better at loosening up tough stains. It was also great at helping dye stick to cloth, so it became indispensable to the textile industry. As late as the 16th century, people were still collecting pee specifically as a mordant, or a treatment that cloth makers could apply to fabric to ensure bright, long-lasting color. Sadly, no one seems to know how they eventually got that smell out, because cat pee is forever. Ask most people if corpses can solve their own murder, and the answer will be, of course not. Ask a modern forensic scientist, and the answer will probably be kind of, since clues found on a corpse quite frequently lead to a suspect. But a thousand years ago, people did actually think that corpses could speak, in a sense. The practice was known as cruentation. It's what people did because they didn't know about DNA, and frankly, they were pretty hopeless at things like gathering evidence, interviewing witnesses, or even caring whether or not they found the actual perpetrator. It was more important to execute some person than it was to make sure you were executing the right person. In those days, people believed that dead people weren't, like, completely, utterly dead, which means that Miracle Max from Princess Bride was historically accurate. Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Early crime investigators thought that if you put a corpse into the presence of its killer, the body would start to bleed. Now, this makes for really dramatic forensics, but the problem was that corpses don't really bleed much after death. So this technique probably didn't lead to a guilty verdict very often. But never mind, there was always a lake they could throw the accused into instead, since buoyant people are clearly more guilty than the ones who sink. Bartering isn't really a thing anymore, at least not in America. A thousand years ago, though, currency wasn't something everyone had, so if you needed food or goods, you had to find other things you could use for money. You know, like eels. Yes, people in England actually used eels for currency. In fact, by the Middle Ages, there were distinct rules about how to count eels. If you had 25 eels, that was a stick. And if you had 10 sticks, that was a bind. The importance of eels to the economy of England dates all the way back to the 8th century, and eels even had a prominent place in 11th century record books. They actually seem to suggest that people paid their rent with eels more often than they did with coins. So why eels? Well, monasteries were big landholders in those days, and collecting rent in eels meant that the monks would never go hungry. Also, feasts thrown by the king often featured eels, so the nobility needed large quantities of them quite often. One popular movie trope has folks circa 1,000 or so years ago tossing buckets of poop into the street, usually from at least the second floor. You know, so we can all laugh at the poor dude who happened to be walking by at the exact right moment. 
Happily, this really is just a trope. Fortunately, there is not much evidence that people actually did this. But that doesn't mean that people who lived a thousand years ago knew much about the potential of feces to transmit awful diseases, especially if it gets into a major water source like the Thames, for example. City dwellers who lived in England a thousand years ago did have to get rid of their poop, and like many modern humans, they ascribed to the dubious policy out of sight and out of mind. It means they were totally cool with just dumping all of their waste into a nearby river, where it would be washed downstream and become someone else's problem, at least in theory. Of course, since everyone was doing it, it eventually became everyone's problem, but it still took a rather disgustingly long time for people to realize that maybe the Thames wasn't the best place to dump raw sewage. Ancient people knew where babies come from, of course, but figuring out contraception was a bit trickier. Unfortunately, the stuff that people tried to do to prevent pregnancy a thousand years ago was mostly borderline gross, or sometimes flat-out disgusting. Here's one that's not super awful, but still highly ill-advised, using a lemon as a cervical cap, which is a practice that dates all the way back to the 2nd century and was still in use during the days of the infamous swinger Casanova. There were also condoms, which sound pretty refreshingly normal compared to lemons, but they were made out of animal guts because rubber and latex weren't actually things a thousand years ago. And as a bonus, though, animal gut condoms were reusable. If you were put off by any of those things, don't worry. You could always drink a lead-infused potion, which probably was actually pretty good at making you infertile. We like to imagine that the people of the distant past were not super romantically adventurous. They were polite and chivalrous, and everything they did in the bedroom was within the bounds of matrimony and 100% approved by the church. But actually, kinkiness is as old as time, and for as long as there have been eels to pay the tab, there have been ladies of the evening willing to indulge customers' weird fantasies. And one of those weird fantasies was common enough that it persisted through the centuries. Sex workers who hung around in cemeteries usually did pretty brisk business. Why? Well, in the Middle Ages, cemeteries were kind of like Party Central. Townspeople would set up graveyard markets, and if you wanted to drink and gamble, you could settle down on your loved one's grave for a beer and a game of dice, and no one would think that was all that weird. But even before that, from the Roman times onward, the ladies of the evening, so to speak, found that they could do dual business in cemeteries. Mourners were hired by day and other stuff at night. Their customers were grave diggers, widowers, and people who had some pretty weird graveyard fetishes. And this wasn't just a passing fad, either. This quirk continued to be a thing for centuries, reaching its peak in 14th century England when the Black Death was killing a lot of people and totally messing with everyone's boundaries. Today, we could really not imagine undergoing a surgical procedure without the use of anesthesia. Not just because it would be awful for the person going under the knife, but also because it would be impossible for the surgeon, who would have to somehow perform precise maneuvers around vulnerable blood vessels and organs while the patient was writhing like a beheaded snake. But it took a long time to develop anesthesia. People recognized the need for surgical procedures thousands of years ago before anyone could even guess that it might be possible to make surgery pain-free. So if you were unfortunate enough to need an operation, you had a couple of choices. Die or have surgery while totally awake and totally lucid. The Greeks, Chinese, and other ancient people did have some form of rudimentary anesthesia. But in Europe, there were few reports of real attempts at pain relief until the early 13th century. That's when surgeons started to experiment with stuff like opium and mandrake. Up until then, if you needed a procedure or, God forbid, you had to have your arm sawed off, you basically got a bottle of whiskey and a piece of wood to bite down on, and you prayed that you would pass out from the pain before it got super awful. 